uh, the thing. So um, we talked about merge um, last time, implemented merge and merge sort for linked lists, which was actually, believe it or not, a very good implementation of merge sort for linked lists. I do not know how to make it better. But it wasn't yet sort of I talked to Ryan and he said, well, people in search need to know more about merge. And I started thinking, indeed, I was rushing things and there are some fundamental truths which I didn't mention. Uh, then, of course, I thought about a whole bunch of things and discovered that I have to move far, far back to really do merge proper. Because if we think about merge as a problem, when we're merging two sequences of roughly the same length, or let us put it not just roughly, but exactly the same length, then merge will, or at least expected, its expected number of comparison is going to be uh, 2n minus 1 if the, every sequence is n elements, uh, the number of comparisons is going to be uh, 2n minus 1. Right? But from which it follows that, you know, a conjecture that if we have sequences of size n and size m, the number of comparisons should be n plus m minus 1. Not every conjecture is true, however. This one is definitely false. Let us look at the simplest counterexample. Let us take a sequence of length 1,000. And let us take a sequence of length 1. How many comparisons do we need to merge them? No. No, wouldn't work. I wish anybody, that would be brilliant, but we don't know how to do that. We actually can prove we cannot do that. But how many do we need? Anybody wants to venture to guess? Log? Log Y? You do binary search. Right? That is, there is this fundamental possibility to use binary search for emerging, dramatically reducing the number of comparisons. Log n is much smaller than n. So that sort of forces me to go, so I'm just explaining, that before we continue our work on merge, we need to just for a second, and you know, my seconds tend to be quite long, uh, to look at binary search. So somebody could say, oh, we'll just use binary search, the standard binary search from some library. Say we will use this search from C library. Sounds a plausible idea. It was written by great Unix guys. They knew something about programming. So let us see what they provide us with. Uh, could I, where is my, what I need to do is uh, click on this. This is binary search, the description from Linux website. So it takes a bunch of things, the key, the base, the length, the size of the element, this is C. It's hard for them. And comparison function, and then they search and search and search, and return something. What? Base, it's an array. The base is the pointer to the beginning, and the length is the number of elements. Right. But never mind what it takes. That's not interesting. What is very interesting is what it returns. It returns null. So could we do merge? 
It's not very useful. Because if we have 1,000 elements and a new element, which goes somewhere into 1,000 elements, it will return very likely null. Not always. It could be a duplicate element. But if it's not a duplicate element, it will return null, at which point you will have to, I guess, do linear search to find where, where to insert. Right? So observe, this is an ancient interface, long sort of understood, done by brilliant people in a standard library. It's utterly useless. Observe another thing, that even if we are so fortunate, let's, let's, let's ignore the case that it's not found that it finds it. Does it help with merge if we want to ma make merge stable? No, it doesn't. Because as it says, if there are multiple elements, it returned some one of them. The first, the last, the middle, 70 percentile, 30 percentile, we do not know. Okay. So here we get to an interesting point. Sort of, you will read in many books in, on algorithms. Uh, it's a typical, typical story goes like that. That uh, binary search is a very hard thing. Nobody could write it. I'll show you how to write it. And then the author proceeds writing it. Uh, in very many cases, even when the book is written by famous people, the author proceeds and comes up with something utterly useless. He pro produces wrong binary search. And here comes another philosophical point, which I want to address for a second. Sort of, uh, what does it mean wrong? What does it mean incorrect? Of course, there is a thing which they taught you at school. They told you that the program is incorrect when it doesn't satisfy its specifications. Well, this is a correct program. I assume, actually it is. I looked at the source. I mean, it does do what it promises to do. It will return null. I wish it were not correct and return something useful. But it does return null. So in some sense, Correctness is a deeper concept than just satisfying specification. Well, in reality, it's for sure a deeper concept because, as you guys well know, you haven't got any specification. When you write code, it's not that you're given specifications and you need to encode them. I suspect that never happened in your life, nor will it happen in, in any foreseeable future. So you have to write something. But you still have to attempt to do something which is correct. Of course, the people who advocate writing specifications say, yes, that's how you do it. You first you will write specifications, then you will implement specifications. Yes, but it's not going to help. Because if you write wrong specification, you are the same guy who is going to write the implementation. Most likely, it will not make it correct. So it's a deeper thing. You have to establish correctness from, if you like, more fundamental principles. The program is correct if it returns desirable information, if it does what it's supposed to do in some absolute sense. You say, well, it's very hard to, to prove it. Yes, it's very hard to prove it. But let us try to see what is the correct way of doing binary search. Now, a little bit about history of binary search. If we look at Knuth, say, or if we talk to most computer, computer scientists, what we observe is the following fairly interesting thing. The first time binary search was described by, as an algorithm, was done by a great American computer scientist and engineer, John Mochley. Of course, you never heard of him. He was the guy who invented the first general purpose computer. But we don't remember people like that. And in 1946, he gave a brilliant series of lectures at Harvard uh, School of, what was it called? The Morse 
Pennsylvania University, pardon me. It was published by Harvard. The book was published by Harvard. It was at Moore School. He gave a brilliant series of lectures on sort of programming. Where, he, by the way, he described things like merge for the first time, merge sort, and uh, uh, binary search. This is not a bad thing to, to be the first, first person to, to describe. Uh, by the way, let us spell his name. His name is spell. Could you please type it? M A U C H Y. Uh, L Y. Mochley. Right. Uh, yes. Like that. You could search for him. And that's the picture. Right. So he designed ENIAC, which should make him very famous. Uh, so, um, indeed, he did some very, very fundamental work. And then comes the interesting fact. Knuth, in his Art of Computer Programming, writes the following thing. That then it takes about 15 years to people to come up with binary search, which sort of works in some conceivable sense for all possible inputs. Right? Apparently, people didn't have trouble coding binary search when n, the length, is of the form 2 to the n minus 1. Because it's easy. You take the middle element, and then the, the other guy, both guys on, on both sides will be of the same form. You keep dividing. But apparently, people couldn't do it. Then, uh, of, of course, here comes the, the interesting thing where I slightly disagree with Knuth. He claims uh, that the first correct, uh, uh, correct uh, implementation was done by uh, D.H. Uh, Lehmer, spelled E, uh, spelled L-E-H-M-E-R. Somebody you need to know about. So let's look at this picture. M E R. Lehmer. Paul Newham. Barely. Yes. The first one is his father. That's the man. Uh, very great a computer scientist. Did amazing amount of work on computational number theory. Things like sieves, discovering large primes, and many other important things. Uh, and, among other things, published a binary search which at least always terminated. That is a good thing. I actually claim that uh, the, in some sense the first correct binary search was published roughly at the same time, a couple of years after that. Uh, by another guy, a German computer scientist, again, unjustly forgotten, so forgotten that he does not appear in Wikipedia and we cannot see his picture, called Hermann Bottenbruch. Bottenbruch the second, yes. The sadly enough, uh, no, it's not him. No, this is, no, no, it's not him. It's some the, the the book. If you go to pictures, the blue, the book. This is the important thing. He was his claim to fame, and why he should have been in Wikipedia, and it's said that he isn't. Uh, he was one of the people who invented Algol 58, the predecessor of Algol 60, and one of the people who tried unsuccessfully to convince American delegates to Algol 58 committee that they should introduce such thing as block structure. So he was one of the inventors of block, you know, block structure, shadowing. Uh, American representatives, which included such brilliant people as John Beckers and Alan Perlis, actually sort of rejected it as too hard to implement. They didn't know how to do stacks. But sadly enough, he doesn't get much credit, nor does he get credit for the fact 
uh, of inventing the f what I believe the, the first correct binary, binary search. We will get, we will see sort of, when we get to binary search, we will see uh, how, how it is, because we will be actually studying his, his version, okay? Now, of course, it would be very contrary to the way I do things to start with binary search. Uh, because how could we do binary search if we cannot yet do linear search? So let us go and spend a little time. Now you have to start Emacs. Uh, and you want to go to lecture 13 and start a file called, uh, say, search.h. Because it will have variety of things relating to search, many things. And we will start, uh, Param will be helping me for, since he sits here. Uh, uh, we will start, you have to turn it on somehow. It's on? So let us see whether we could sort of, our goal is to write Linear search. By the way, anybody knows if if STL has linear search? Anyone? Find if. Find if, yes. Or find in some sense. We will get to it, but find if if is a general version of linear search in STL. Let's ignore it. Let's assume STL does not exist. Let us see how to write it. This is a very simple thing. So what again we could basically do it two ways. We could assume that we know what we're doing, then we start from the top and start right template. Or we could assume that we don't know what we're doing, which is usually the case when I start with things. So I, I seldom start writing code from the signature. I don't know what the signature is. I have some algorithmic idea, so I typically start writing the algorithmic idea which is typically an inner loop, right? And then, so, I put this idea as writing code inside out. So, that will be while. While first is not equal to last. That's a good, good sort of start, yes. So, we know that we're going to be doing that. And then? You have to compare star first to something. So either a predicate or a value. Yep. Where do we compare it? Uh, like right after the while. I wouldn't do that. No. I'm lazy. You want to do it in the while? Uh, Let us try to think about what does it mean to do linear search. I go till either I hit the wall or till I find something. So while I don't hit the wall and I didn't find anything, keep doing what? Uh, plus plus first. Keep walking. That's, everybody follows, it's just, and Star, no, oh, this is good, this is good. So how do we replace star? Star first, uh, equal, equal value is one. For example, but that's too specific. Maybe we want to look for a good element. So we pass in a predicate and say, and pred star first. No, and let's write it his way and see why he's wrong. Okay. Um, first, not last, and not. And not. You keep walking while you didn't hit the wall or didn't find the element. Then we use De Morgan law and we transform it. Right? Do we need to do anything else? We need to indent. That, of course, pertains to. Uh, okay, 
So we need to start with the signature, then we'll indent. So what do we need to pass? What, what, what do we need to pass? First, last, and pred. And what do we return? Uh, first. Why is it enough to return first? They already gave us last, so they can check if first is the same as last, and that would tell them whether we found something. So if we don't find, we return something which is equal to last. If it's not equal to last, it points to the something which satisfies the predicate. Right? We might actually, if we're good, we might even write it as a post condition, if we're good. Right? But let us, let us first. So when we stop, what do we know? OK, template type. Uh, now, you angle brackets come after templates, not before. At least in the language which I know. Yes. Template type name I, uh, comma type name P. P big P big P. Little P would be very confusing. And then we should call it find if or something else. Before we call it, what are the, what are the concepts? What what is I and what is P? Um, I is a forward iterator. Is it? What's the difference? We're going to return first, so. It works with both. Yeah. What's the difference? Uh, once you advance the input iterator, you can no longer, all the previous values are uh, you know, invalid. Yes, after you advance. But until we advance, we can still return it. Yes. OK, so i is an input iterator. That is, this is a beautiful example of an algorithm which is not just one directional, but a single pass. We don't, I mean, we could literally run through the data structure and there is an evil monster which sort of eats everything with, you know. I'm sure you've seen some movie, you know, by Spielberg where something like that is happening. Right? Uh, P is a... We need to write animation for all the algorithms. Unary function returning a bool. It's called, is there a name? There is a name for unary function returning a bool. Anybody knows? What? What kind of predicate? Unary predicate, yes. It's actually good to know these names, especially we need to learn them before Bjarne comes. Because, you know, at least I, I'm counting at least, we need at least six people in the class when he comes. Uh, what is it? Is it, uh, there is a difference between what we say here, which is these are conditions on types. And what you say is first last is a valid range. That's the technical term. What is a valid range, by the way, anybody could describe? or try to say in English? Uh, if first is uh, advanced, ultimately it will hit last. And this is very good. You need to say something about star. Oh, and uh, dereferencing, it will be possible at all points except when it hits last. Thank you. So that's what it means, valid range. Right? So this is a precondition. This is not a condition on types. So we do not put it there. We put it inside the function. What does it return? I. It returns I. But, and what do we call it? Find if. Again, why do we call it find if? Because it is called find if in STL. By the way, why is it called find if in STL? Anybody? But why did I call it find if? Did I make up the name? Common list. Yes, I stole it from common list. Again, always try to borrow from someplace. Sort of originality is frowned upon, in, in, right? especially in name selection. We will see it soon. Uh, quite, uh, Obviously, people love introducing non-standard names. Uh, okay. 
uh, there's something missing. Yes, you have to return. Otherwise, you no, know. no. No, just return first. That's it. I mean, except for you know, um, preconditions, postconditions. But right. So what is the precondition? That's the precondition. Uh, but it's not how we write it. Square bracket first. It is a semi-open range. And in mathematics, you say, like so. Yes. Again, we, yes, Colin could go away. It's a valid range. And the post condition will be uh, either first equal to last or Fred of first is true. And that is the first value for which that is true. So that's the other thing we should probably. Yes. Okay. We could, of course, it would be a little difficult to say that. So let's say it in English. It's the leftmost value, which is for no other value the predict prior to that, uh, it will be true. Yes? So now we, we know a little bit, ab at least, about linear search. But uh, one of the mistakes which frequently happens is that people use the principle of, uh, sort of say, we need to use Occam razor. We need to have only one find if. And it actually, what, that's what happened. I have to tell you a little story about origin of find if in C++. After I submitted STL, it had many, many functions, including many, many find functions. But uh, Bjarne was very afraid that, uh, that STL is too large and will not be accepted as is because of its enormous size. Uh, it wasn't that enormous, but at that point, so he said, why don't I come to Palo Alto, I was working for HP Labs at the time, uh, with, and bring along a bunch of other standard committee people, and we will trim it. And the part of trimming, it was a sad thing. It's, you know, imagine somebody coming with a knife and cutting you know, pieces of your flesh. So one of the things that, of course, he said that there should be only one find if. And uh, you ask, so what else existed? What else existed? There existed a very useful function, which I always, the moment I start programming, I say, oh, never mind what the standard committee did. I'll just put it back. It takes about 30 seconds, so it's very easy. It was a function find if not because sometimes you want guys who are good sometimes you want guys who are bad and you have some predicate and you could say well but couldn't you find a way of negating it well i actually did on bjarne's demand i introduced functions not one and not two which negate unary and binary predicates if they're written in a certain way, whatever you do, that's not. But it's, it's annoying. It's actually much easier to read the code if you have a function, find if not. And uh, if you have complicated things which allow you to get, you could just implement it in terms of find if. If not, you could implement it the way Param and I will implement it right now. But implement it, you must. Fortunately, I think the standard committee in C11 put find if not back into the standard. But of course, they didn't do it, as we shall see, in a correct way. They didn't put all the not functions back, but only some. And some things they put back incorrectly, as we shall see in a second. But let us define find if not. I recommend using powerful machinery called cut and paste. Including the template. 
Yes. Observe. And then just take the exclamation point out. Change the name. That, that's good. And take the exclamation point out. Now, the, that allows us to, to do certain things, which we'll see in a second. But before, you know, I have a certain plan. So let us try to follow this plan. Okay. That allows us, for example, to quickly implement three functions which were introduced into C11 by uh, the standard committee which are called all of, none of, and any of. Of course, prior to the standard committee inventing names throughout the world, they were known as all, none, or some. But again, they couldn't resist this opportunity to add of to, to the name. The question, why didn't I put them in STL? I did have find, I had find if not. And I actually, somebody asked me in 1994 why I didn't have this function. I gave them the answer. What was the answer? You can just write find if something something equal equal last. But you know, that doesn't answer the question of isn't it more convenient to say any? Well, basically my attitude was I write algorithms, not wrappers. It is just a wrapper around, let us write all of. Now, let us implement it and see what's the implementation. OK, let us use our powerful technology called cut and paste. OK, so uh, we need to change the name, yes. Bull, all of. While first is not. Well, we just call. Should we just call find? Yes, we should just call. And therefore, we should do what with the function? Meaning, it should be in line. All the previous ones. Well, oh, this one should well, be. This one should be in line because it's not doing anything. So before bull, you could say, uh, I would put in a separate line. Uh, OK? And then what do you return? You, you don't need any while. No, you still need a valid range. The precondition holds. So you return. First, last, pred. Uh, equal, equal, last. Uh, is that correct? Or is, if not, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is, you know, we will. Everybody follows? It's very simple, guys. Huh? Now, uh, observe. Now let us copy paste this and generate none. Anybody wants to suggest a solution for that? None of. Find you if. Find if. Mm, I think that's it. And now you have to think. Any of. Any of. Any. Try to do it in term not sort of. Not equal to last. Yes, exactly right. No, 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 no. It's called any of. Find if yes. And take not out. So if there is something which is not it will not be equal to last. Very, very simple thing. Now, I have to address another little issue before we jump into binary search. 
the issue is that once upon a time, I believed before STL became the standard that ranges come in two kinds. In two kinds. Some ranges are like that. First, last. You give two pointers, two iterators from first to last. And then there is another kind where you give first and n. That's another kind. The terms which Paul and I use is bounded and counted. Which one is better? Both are good and they are different. So sort of the you cannot say that that one is better than the other because sometimes you have a count, sometimes you have the end, sometimes it's better to express algorithm which use finding in terms of one. Sometimes it's better to express it in terms of the other. We'll see soon examples like that. Of course, during this butchering process, all the counted ranges disappeared because why do we need counted when we have bounded? Then standard community started a slow process, lasted 20 years, of putting some of them back. As you see, it's very easy to take things out. It's actually apparently hard to put them back correctly. Let us look at an example of how these people do things. Could we go back to our browser? Actually, so find if n, what should it return? Should we? Let us know. We will discuss it. But let us work slowly. Let us see, for example, one thing which they realized very quickly, that there is an STL function copy, which copies from here to there into there. Then, of course, they realize the copy in is really convenient. Could we look at the interface of copy in? If you go and Google for type it in up there, STD copy in. Which is again the question is how could you get it wrong? But we shall see how you could get it wrong. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, both of them are good because, or both. They show you the interface. That is good enough. So what you take, you take first, you take count. You write them in a the result, you write n guys into the result. And you return output iterator where result moves. By the way, just before that, can we look at copy? Just to see interface of copy. Because you know, we could write copy, but let's here just look at the interface. Co copy. Copy. You see, we look at copy. Why is copy returning output iterator? Why is it returning where result not? Why do you think it's returning? Not you. Anybody else? Otherwise? You, you have to iterate from the beginning, and you might not even be able to. Remember the model of the dragon behind you? You have to, if you want to continue writing, you have to return. Right? So what do they do? Let's go back to copy n. They say, we will do the same. We will return output iterator. Now, I claim they are silly. Why are they silly? Since you are their friend, tell us. <laughs> No, you cannot. You have to return the output to data absolutely. That was not the question. The question was not why do you need to return output to data. You absolutely have to return it for that very reason. But it's not enough. Okay. 
So Bert tried to come with a sort of general thing, the general thing which he suggested, you should be able to restart the algorithm. Right? You copied something. You want to copy more. Yes? So we, have, we have passed the input iterator, but now the caller doesn't know where it is anymore? The caller doesn't know where it is anymore. You couldn't continue. You could continue on the output. Fortunately, they got, I mean, with these people, anything is doable. They could have taken that away. But that they kept. But we don't know how far, I mean, we know how far, n steps, but that could be a linked list. So what do you do? You go back, so again, you have to think, you have to think what to return. The basically, every useful information needs to be returned so people who are clients of your function could, if you like, restart the computation, proceed intelligently in whatever they're doing. Right? This is a general principle, which is, you say, well, everybody gets it. Guys, no, not everybody. That was reviewed by hundreds of people and not noticed. And there are mistakes every time they do something. That was a mistake. Yes? And your original submittal was long lost. My original submittal is long lost. And who even knows what was in it, by the way? Right. Uh, there was somebody, there is a guy who started right now trying to find out what was the original thing. Sadly enough, when you know, I was doing all of that, I didn't know Paul. Because if I knew Paul, he would convince me to save every step on the development. Finally, you know, now it's just gone. We cannot retrieve it. So besides the point, but let us now, so do you understand the utility, by the way, of these counted ranges? They are very useful, and we will see them very quickly when we start doing things like binary search. Remember, that's what we're getting to. Now we have to try with param, that's what we will try, to write find if underscore n. Okay. So let's let us. We started in our usual way. We will take find if and copy paste it because you know it, it has something good about it. Okay, so uh, did we do it? Um, we need another type of. Yes, we need to start with template. We obviously, well, it's you could. By the way, you could do it both two ways. You could also start f the way we started from, from inside. Yeah, in this case, we know we need an n here. So let's you need an n, yes. And what is n? Do, by the way, do we absolutely need an n? We need some way to count. And we have two choices, guys. We have two choices. And I would go with Param's choice, but it's not self-evident, yes. We could get the difference type. There we go. Difference type of the iterator, if you remember our iterator lecture. We could do that. But I go with param. Why do I go with param? I mean, conceptually, this has nothing to do with the iterator. The programmer is saying, I want five things. Conceptually, it does in some sense. That is, n must be representable in that type. But it can be a different type. It could be short. I don't want to do cast if somebody gives me short. So I go along with you. But we have to say what you just said. OK, so n is an integral type such that? Integral type. And no, that's a precondition. That's a precondition. Thank you. Okay, so, anything, so in the, the second parameter of the function? Uh, actually, you will see it's... Capital N, little n. Yes. Um, now, how do we represent a counted range? I suggest a very simple thing. We replace last with n. We say first n, it's still semi-open range, guys. No, 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 no. No. That would be bounded range. J 
just put n there. No, 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 first comma n. This, that's what we do in elements of programming. Do you say it's a counted range or? I guess? Well, you know that it's a counted range because if the types are the same, it's bounded. If the types are different, and the second one, I mean, you know, overloading. Uh, and this, another precondition will be? Uh, but actually, you no longer need to say that the valid range would do it. It's cheating, but it's a valid range. You know, you could go as far as then within this iterator. Now, there is no last. While n. We are, of course, we're violating one of my great principles, which not relying on implicit conversions. But here, you see, we have two choices. Let, let me just show you so that we could do it properly. If Ryan were here, he would force me. But Ryan is in Bakersfield, so we could do it somewhat uncleanly, but more beautifully. We could write n is equal, equal, capital N, open paren zero. That's like no, because we have to cast zero. But that might be too overwhelming. So we could do it and just assume every integral type is convertible to bool with, it's, it's, so anybody wants to argue one way or the other? Okay, both ways, this, this does not depend and this is what Ryan would want. But, you know, in my code, it's actually I dropped that. I just say while n. Okay, I guess we know where. What is, what is this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, really the question. What do we need to return, guys? You argue. You tell me. 